So tonight, or this morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12. In a few moments, verses 22 to 32 will serve as our text. And my sermon title this morning is actually in the form of a question. It's a question that maybe you've asked yourself. It's a question that maybe someone in your family has asked you if they have done this. I've had people to ask this question of me. I've had people ask me, how can I know that I have not done this? So my title in the form of a question is this. Is there a sin God cannot forgive? Is there a sin that God cannot forgive? The short answer to that is yes. And if indeed Jesus himself will teach us this morning that there is such a sin that is unforgivable, then we do well to try to figure out what that sin is so that we can avoid it. So Billy Graham speaks about his dad. He says, when my father was a young man, he attended a revival meeting in North Carolina and became convinced through the sermon that he had committed the unpardonable sin. And he lived with this awful thought for many years. He agonized over it, was frightened by it, and thought of himself as a doomed man who would never repent of his sin. Now, thankfully... He was able to get connected with a good pastor, with good biblical insight, and was reassured that the very fact he was concerned about it was evidence that he had not committed it. William Cowper, you probably don't know William Cowper, but he authored the hymn that I bet you know, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. He almost went out of his mind fearing he had committed the unforgivable sin. John Bunyan. That name might resonate a little bit. He's the one who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He was tormented by the thought that he had committed the unpardonable sin. Quote, I feared, therefore, that this wicked sin of mine might be that sin that's unpardonable. He wrote that in one of his memoirs. Perhaps you thought, I've done something. That God will not forgive. And I know that there's a repertoire of sins represented by this group of people. And all of us have got some things back there in the past. And we're thinking, my goodness, is that forgivable? Has the Lord forgiven me of that? And of course, Satan wants to get in there and he wants to perch on our shoulders, as it were, and whisper things into our ears or even shout them that you're not right with God. How in the world? And so maybe I'm not as concerned about people in this room right this moment being fearful about having committed the unpardonable sin, but there could very well be somebody who will listen to me via the live stream. And maybe that's a question that you've got. Or if you do, but with, with God's help, we're going to try to figure out what that sin is and then determine whether or not we have committed it, whether we know somebody who may have committed it and what those ramifications are. So, um, In verses 22 and 23 of Matthew chapter 12, I want us to notice first the amazing ability of Christ. The amazing ability of Christ. This will set the context in which some accusations will be made and the revelation about an unforgivable sin will be brought forth. So, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. Then one was brought to him, that is Jesus, who was demon-possessed. This man was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could could this be the son of David? And so, boy, I tell you what, I, I I don't mind admitting it. I was so proud of my son, Jake, when he preached for me Sunday a week ago. And of course, if you were here or you listened online, you know that he, he, he preached about a man who was demon-possessed, who had a legion of demons, and God delivered him of that. Here we have it again. But this one's almost like a triple miracle because this man receives his sight, he's able to speak, and he has his sanity. And so this particular miracle of Jesus delivering this demon-possessed man and restoring sight, etc., it demonstrated Jesus' power over the spirit world. Demon, come out. It also demonstrated his power over the physical world because it healed him of his blindness. 
And so, appropriately so, the multitudes were amazed. They're dumbfounded and they're thinking, maybe, maybe he's the one. This reference to, could this be the son of David? They recognized that such miracles just might be a part of the prophetic, messianic one that had been promised from their Old Testament scriptures. But boy, 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 not everybody is amazed. That brings us secondly to the appalling accusation that is made against Christ. The appalling accusation made against Christ. We're going to see it in verse 24. Matthew 12, verse 24. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So here's a man who can see, he can speak, and I don't know if it's the first time in his life he sees. I don't know if it's the first time in his life he speaks. He's got his right mind. He's been set free from demon possession. And it's almost as though these Pharisees, they don't even see him. They don't marvel. They're not rejoicing. They're not amazed. Instead, they're accusing Jesus of doing what he did Because of Beelzebub's power. Beelzebub was another name for Satan. They're claiming that Jesus did what he did in Satan's power. Um, um, So the intent of the Pharisees was to poison the minds of people against Jesus. Now, Jesus' power was undisputable. There's evidence of it. That man's talking, that man is seeing, that man's in his right mind. There's no longer any ungodly sounds coming out of his mouth. So there's power that's obvious. They don't want to admit that Jesus did it with supernatural power from God. Because if they do that, well then, Houston, we've got a real problem. Because then that means that He is the Messiah, and they refused to accept that. So they attribute the supernatural power of this deliverance to Satan. And um, that brings us thirdly to the alarming answer made by Christ. We're going to see that in verses 25 to 32. An appalling accusation has been made, and we're going to see Jesus' alarming answer to them. Now, Jesus will first say that the Pharisees' charge is so illogical. Listen to what Jesus says in verses 25 and 26. But Jesus knew their faults and said to them, "Um, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So since exorcisms bring healing and not harm, Jesus asks if they really think that a malignant, demonic power would cooperate in such widespread efforts to bring deliverance to people. Come on. It made no sense, no sense whatsoever. Satan does not cast out Satan. Satan is not divided against himself. And so therefore it was preposterous to accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the ruler of demons. And so the Pharisees, they, listen carefully, the Pharisees did not reject Jesus for lack of evidence, but because they were already biased against him. They refused. They, they, it's almost like, and Rex and I were reminded of this, we went out and, and saw the Grand Canyon and saw other things. Folks, I mean, um, the Dales, they just recently uh, went to see the Ark. And they also went to the um, Creation Museum. And I've told you folks, you, those, those are two places you are to go to as well, even though I've not been to the Ark yet. I've been to the Creation Museum. And I asked them if y'all went into the, the planetarium in the Creation Museum Folks, if you ever go to the Creation Museum, pay the extra money and go into the planetarium. It is worth every penny. I remember reclining back in those chairs, and then you just see everything lit up. It's, I have never felt smaller in my life. It just, it has this dramatic way of just zooming out and giving you an idea of how large, how immense creation is. 
And so here, the Pharisees, there's evidence that Jesus is who he's claiming to be. They had to suppress all that knowledge just like people do today. They can look around, folks. They can look around and see. There's obviously somebody out there responsible for all that we see. There is somebody inside of me who speaks. God put him there, her there, my conscience. And they have to suppress all of that to come up with their conclusions to reject Jesus. And that's what these Pharisees are doing. As a matter of fact, um, flip back, if you will, in your Bibles, you might need to. um, In verse 14, this is fairly early on in Jesus' earthly ministry. Verse 14, the Pharisees went out and plotted against him that they might destroy him. So that's their intent. We want him eliminated. And so guess what? You see evidence of a phenomenal miracle. Refuse to accept it. We want him destroyed. He's not divine. We want him destroyed. So that, that's the mentality that they have. And so Jesus, in verses 28 and 29, he speaks of an unstoppable power. Obviously, he's the one who has that unstoppable power. Verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, which he did, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. So Jesus is now illustrating with an analogy or a short parable. Somebody who wants to attack someone's house, he cannot do so and take all the goods out unless he takes care of the strong man who's guarding the house, who's protecting the house. Well, guess what? Satan is that strong man. But Jesus is the stronger man. And just like Kevin just got through singing, Jesus has come and he has broken Satan's power. Satan still exists. He's still powerful. But all folks, one day, one little word shall fail him. So said Martin Luther's hymn. Um, um, The exorcisms demonstrate that God in Christ is decisively defeating the devil. And so what is happening is not the result of a civil war within Satan's ranks, but a direct onslaught from the outside. And that somebody from the outside is Jesus himself. So here's Jesus' point. I'm going to kind of summarize it for you. Jesus' point was this. Haven't I demonstrated before you and all of Israel my power over Satan and his evil kingdom of darkness and destruction? Haven't I demonstrated beyond all doubt that my authority is higher than Satan's? Haven't I cleansed people of every kind of disease and freed them from every kind of demonic control and oppression? Haven't I demonstrated my authority over both sin and death? Haven't I rescued souls from hell? Who could have such a power and authority but God himself? Who but God could enter the very house of Satan and successfully bind him and plunder his goods? Jesus is saying in so many words, I have shown you that I can defeat Satan and a legion of his demonic hosts at will. How could I be any other than your divine Messiah? They don't want to hear it. He needs to be destroyed. They didn't want to hear it. Satan, again, is presently still powerful, but his power is limited. His doom is sealed and his time is short. Now we drop down to verses 31 and 32. And Jesus speaks of an unforgivable sin. Verse 31, therefore, so based on everything that I've just said, based on this demonstration of my power, your rejection of it, your foolish, illogical question in my response to that, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. All righty, here we go. Uh, The first part of verse 31. Therefore, I say to you, every 
sin will be forgiven men. So within that context, there are all sorts of, of sins that can fall into the category of forgivable. And so having said that, let me just pause for a moment and let's just spend a few moments thinking about what the unforgivable sin is not, okay? Let's just think about what it's not. Let's just do this process of elimination. We're trying to figure out what the unforgivable sin is. What is it not? Number one, it's not adultery. It's not sexual perversion of any kind. It's not homosexuality. It's not lesbianism. It's not bestiality. It's none of that. Because we know 1 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 6, verses, what is it, um, 9, 10, 11, right in there. He talks about people who committed all those kinds of sins, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You've been forgiven and cleansed of those sins. It's not murder. It's not genocide. And it's not abortion. Kevin talked about how, you know, this, this leakage of the, of the rough draft of the Supreme Court decision that might be indicating a reversal of Roe versus Wade. Well, I mean, in, in, in my mind, this is just my little old take on it. I think it was deliberately leaked so that there might be a ruhaha, so that maybe some conservative justices might think, I don't think I want to go there. And they changed their vote. People who professed even to know Jesus have had abortions, multiple abortions. I've talked to people like that. That's not the unforgivable sin. God's grace is greater than our sin of abortion, and people can be gloriously forgiven of it. It's not murder. We, we know that's not the case because of all people. Paul, he's the one who's standing there with Stephen's cloak on his arms, just consenting to his death and who knows how many others when he was persecuting the church. And by the way, even the murder of Jesus was forgivable because there were some soldiers there who had blood splatter on them. And if we could have done some DNA investigation, guess what? The blood type was Jesus' blood. But yet one of those centurions would see how Jesus handled it all and would say, my Lord, and my God, I believe he spoke with saving faith. Even the murder of Jesus could be forgiven. Suicide. Suicide is not the unforgivable sin. So in my three decades of pastoral ministry now, my goodness, how fast they have flown by. I have done, I've done four or five funerals of someone who committed suicide. And what I learned, and Alice, your dear Rod, one of my best mentors. You two. Hmm. Y'all made a tremendously positive impact on me and a whole lot of others like me. And um, Rod, Rod took his life, as many of you know. Of course, I participated in his funeral. And so early on, in my pastoral ministry, I realized that, boy, when somebody takes their life and it's time for the funeral, everybody's asking the same unspoken question. Did they go to hell? Is suicide the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin? I submit to you, it is not. If people who killed the very Messiah, Jesus, could be forgiven, then obviously people who take their own life can be forgiven. I do not believe at all that it's an automatic sentence. It's not the unpardonable sin. So again, Jesus in verse 31 says every sin, and then he says, and, and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Well, we know that's true. Yes, even blasphemy can be forgiven. We know that because, again, Paul's testimony. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. I thank him. Speaking about the Lord, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to this service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. All right, that, that last phrase there, that's where we start differentiating 
Paul's blasphemy from their blasphemy. Paul's blasphemy was different from theirs because his was done in ignorance and unbelief. The Pharisees was in blatant denial of what they could not deny. Paul on the road to Damascus was not yet convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. These Pharisees knew. They knew. The evidence was so overwhelming. And so the more overwhelming the evidence was, the harder their hearts became. When Paul on that road to Damascus saw the risen Savior, man, boom, he, he, he turned from his rebellious ways. The blasphemy for which there is no forgiveness is deviant irreverence. The uniquely terrible sin of intentionally and openly speaking evil against the holy God or defaming or mocking him. You see, the Pharisees, as one commentator put it, consciously disputing, they were consciously disputing the indisputable. Deep inside, they knew Jesus was the Messiah, but they refused to admit it. So, blasphemy against the Spirit not only reflected unbelief, but determined unbelief. The refusal after seeing all the evidence necessary to complete understanding, even to consider believing in Christ, they just, that, that was their refusal. So the difference is then between failure to recognize the light and deliberate rejection of it once enlightened. Let me just kind of repeat that. And I've got another statement coming that will, well, actually, that one is there. The difference then is between failure to recognize the light and de deliberate rejection of it once recognized. You see, blaspheme in the Holy Spirit is a hardening against God that is deliberate and irreversible. Blasphemy of the Spirit is not so much an act of rejection as it is a persistent and decisive rejection of the Spirit's message and work, all of which points to Jesus. Um, so I've done a funeral. I'm going to keep this very generic because I don't want anybody trying to figure it out. But um, I, I did a funeral in my pastoral ministry in which I was assisting. I was not the only one. And so... I could not help but notice this was a graveside service. So, you know, if it's, if it's at the funeral home at Wilkerson's, I mean, I, I'm up here on the stage and people are out there and family are over there. But this was a graveside service. And so, I mean, I'm standing here and, and family is just, I mean, like three arms lengths. And there was a dude sitting right there. And folks, I'm telling you, um, I don't remember now how many seconds or minutes into the graveside service, but he is looking that way. I'm standing here. The other pastor standing here. He looks off that way. Had his legs stuck out all the way, and he's just looking out. He, I, the whole time. And I remember just kind of looking there, and I'm just, I'm kind of looking around, and I'm just kind of, I, I, I like to just look at people and read the audience and see how, yeah, whether I should pray for the other guy, hey man, hurry it up, you're losing them, or or whatever. And uh, and I'm thinking to myself, he was so not interested. Now, he might have been sick, but he didn't look sick. He looked like he was disgusted. And I couldn't help but wonder, has someone like that possibly or if, if they've not crossed over, are they approaching a line after which God says, you know what? I'm going to leave you alone. You so don't want anything to do with me, I'm going to let you have your way. Um, so this whole blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it's not just something that they said. What they said was evidence of what was in their heart. That's why, same context, you drop down to verse 34. It talks about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So out of the abundance of their wicked, Christ-rejecting, Holy Spirit-blaspheming hearts, they said that Jesus had done these works by the power of Satan. The words reflected their heart. So, okay, all right, let's go back and think again of what maybe. 
blasphemy of this, uh, against the spirit, unforgivable sin is or is not. What about being a traitor? I mean, come on. We know one, right? Oh, Peter. And maybe someone would think, well, why, why, why was that different? Um, there's Peter who forsook the Lord with his eyes wide open, even after he'd been warned. Uh, but folks, it's obviously not the same. Peter's threefold denial of Jesus was a blip on the radar, if you will, of his spiritual conscience. Because almost as soon as he completed the third denial, man, he's grief. And he went out and wept. You don't ever see these Pharisees weeping. Their hard-heartedness has prevented any show of remorse. And, of course, the Lord would forgive Peter when he goes on to be the keynote speaker at, the, at Pentecost when 3,000 got saved. How had the scribes and Pharisees reached such a deplorable condition? By constantly and consistently refusing to accept the spirit-created evidence that proved Jesus to be the Messiah. So if you take clay and you sit it out in 90 plus degree temperature and add no moisture to it over time, what will it become? Hard. Just as hard as a rock. You take the spiritual heart of a man, of a woman, and you expose it to disbelief, unbelief, rejection of Jesus, uh, rejection of the Spirit's wooing, and you do that long enough, and you've got a rock-hard heart. That's what the Pharisees had. So, let me just ask the question and then give you a definition potentially. What is blasphemy against the Spirit? It's the persistent and unrepentant resistance against the work of the Holy Spirit and his message concerning Jesus. It is the final and complete rejection of Jesus Christ. So, I think... We're, we're, we're approaching another question that maybe some of you have in your mind, and I would like to try to give an answer to it. Somebody can blaspheme God the Father, can speak evil against him. Somebody can blaspheme and speak evil against Jesus. There's still hope in both those cases because you've got God the Father who sent Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah, when he went back into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. Guess what? There's not a fourth member of the Trinity. Trinity's three. There's not, there's not another member of the Godhead. So if you reject the Holy Spirit and his attempt to woo and convince and convict and save, etc., if you take all of his pointing to Jesus and say, no, no, there's nobody after him. That's why uh, one guy by the name of B.H. Carroll, he says, if one blasphemes the Father, there still remains the Son and the Holy Spirit. If he blasphemes the Son, there is still the Holy Spirit. But he blasphemes the Holy Spirit, there is none left. All of deity is gone. And so there is no recourse left for him. It is the end result of a gradual, habitual, and growing enmity against God. So let me just uh, throw a scripture at you that you've probably heard before, but it is a very sobering one. It's Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. So there can come a time in a person's life where God says, I'm leaving you alone. I'm leaving you alone. There comes a time when God turns the lights out, as it were, when further opportunity for salvation is forever lost. That's why, and I realize almost every one of you, if not all of you, you already know Christ is your Savior. So my next appeal is especially for anybody who might hear me later on. Everything I've been saying for the last however many minutes is part of the reason why 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And so anytime and every time somebody feels like God is calling them, the Holy Spirit is wooing them and drawing them to the Savior, and they say no, that, that's dangerous. That's dangerous because with every time we say no to the Lord, our heart gets a little harder and a little harder and a little harder. 
Um, You've maybe heard this poem. There is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, that marks the destiny of men from glory to despair. There is a line by us unseen which crosses every path, a hidden boundary between God's mercy and his wrath. So, if someone were to come up to you, let's just say even today, and say, hey, look, you're, you're a close friend of mine, and I know you, you go to church regularly, and you believe in God, and all this kind of stuff. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to tell you what I did, at least not right now. I don't want to tell you what I did, but I, 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 sinned, I sinned terribly. Do you think it's possible I committed the unpardonable sin? You can say to them again, the very fact that you're concerned about it is evidence that you haven't. Because the Pharisees would never, from this point on, they would never feel like, oh man, I think we made a gross mistake. No. When God lets you go, you don't feel any pull from that point on. But the good news is the gospel provides grace that is greater than all our sin. And so let's be thankful that, man, I've got my laundry list. You, folks, you have no idea how long my laundry list of sins are. Is. Is. Um, but boy, they're under the blood. And for that, I am thankful. Let's pray.